Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for SPIRIT, the Stimulating Program Initiative for Retirees that Inspires Thought. I'm Judy Steinig, Director of Community Programs for the Orthodox Union, and it's my honor to coordinate and host this program. The OU started SPIRIT several years ago as an on-site program, and now we're happy to present it as an online program for baby boomers, empty nesters, active retirees, not yet retirees, sandwich generation parents and seniors, everybody who's looking for opportunities for educational, intellectual and spiritual growth. Since everyone still continues to shelter in because of the pandemic, spirit has become the perfect way for everyone to engage in a virtual setting. Today, we're having a very unique and exciting program. We will learn how to do gluten-free baking. It is our pleasure to welcome Elaine Bodenheimer to the Spirit Forum. Elaine has been teaching and writing about gluten-free baking for over 15 years and will have some wonderful recipes and techniques to share with us. It is my pleasure and honor to turn the program over to Elaine. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, many people become very intimidated when they hear the words gluten-free. And I want to show you today how it is not necessary to be intimidated whatsoever. As a matter of fact, if you have potato starch in your house, you're good to go. Uh, some people have gluten-free members in their families. Some people just want to be able to make something uh, on a one-time uh, opportunity when they have guests for Shabbos or during the week and they get panicky, what should I serve for dessert? Uh, should I just put out some fruit and call it a day? If you've ever made a cake for Pesach, you can make a gluten-free uh, recipe all year. So the one that I'm going to do today is one recipe and we get four different things out of it. Each one is totally different. And when you make these recipes, nobody will know that you started off with the same basic chocolate cake recipe. So actually this comes from gourmet kosher cooking. I like to give credit. And it's called a super moist chocolate cake for Passover. Um, as I said, all you need that's different from your regular ingredients, the sugar, uh, eggs, oil, uh, you need potato starch and gluten-free. Let me just explain something. Gluten-free means you cannot use any of the following five grains, which we normally use to make hummus meat. Um, wheat, barley, rye, oats, and spelt. So some people say, well, I had somebody come over, they said they're gluten-free, but they eat spelt kala. They are not gluten-free. They are wheat allergic or wheat sensitive. That's a separate issue. And gluten-free is not an allergy, actually. It is... Um, it's a condition where it's a malabsorption condition where people who are exposed to gluten whose bodies cannot um, um, uh, work with that uh, have a severe reaction and it means the villi, if you remember your biology in high school, if the villi just kind of dropped in. So uh, actually how I got into this is my husband was diagnosed with celiac uh, 18 years ago. He was not a child and he's a physician. And when somebody said to him, you have celiac, he says, but I'm not a kid. And when he learned about it in medical school, um, that he, they learned about it as a pediatric condition. And he was shocked to find out that he had celiac. So um, yeah, so that was quite an experience. And, um, and subsequent to that, I got into the total gluten-free world. At that time, it wasn't so easy because there weren't a lot of uh, ready-made things that were gluten-free. You had to start everything from scratch, which is what I basically learned how to do. And nowadays it's simple. There, there's a mix for this and a mix for that. But if you are a regular home, you know, regular kit, have a regular kitchen and you want to make something gluten-free, you don't have to throw out your utensils, just wash them, you know, as you would, I'm sure, carefully anyway, and um, just use ingredients that have no gluten in them. So the first thing you have to make sure is you're not using wheat, barley, rye, oats, or spelt. And you might ask, well, how do people eat matzo on Pesach? Well, there, there's what's called gluten-free oats. There are gluten-free oats. And those have been developed um, in England, uh, actually in Scotland and in America. And so uh, there are a couple of companies that make gluten-free matzah. Um, actually the one in England has a 
as of last year, still had a blue stripe on the box, which meant that it has some gluten in there. It is not 100% gluten free. And most people, many people will react to that. So be careful with that um, English matzo. But I think there's one in Lakewood that is really gluten free. So you can get oats that are gluten free. But um, when someone is diagnosed with celiac, certainly in the first year or two, they are told not to eat oats and the reason, even gluten-free oats. And the reason for that is that, um, my husband and I have a disagreement about this, but um, the, the nurse who co-wrote the book with, um, um, I forgot about the guy's name right now, uh, from Columbia University, Columbia Hospital, who wrote the book on celiac, told me that, um, that oats are very close chemically to wheat and a lot of people will react even to gluten-free oats. So sometimes uh, there is now gluten-free oatmeal and gluten-free oats, this and that, and there are, there are uh, cookies and cakes and stuff that have gluten-free oats in them. So if a person is diagnosed with celiac, they have to be very careful the first year or two not even to eat those oats. And sometimes they can manage it later. Like when I make gluten-free, rolls, uh, hamotzi rolls for my husband, he can have one roll, a small roll for Friday night, one for Shabbos lunch, but he can't eat you know, as much as he wants because when he did that, he broke out in what was called her, um, dermatitis herpetiformis, which is one of the um, skin reactions that is typical of a person with celiac. Okay, so let's go get into the recipe. This one is a chocolate cake, which is a basic gluten-free chocolate cake. And it starts at six eight. Now, what I've done is, from for this particular demonstration, I've doubled all the ingredients so that I will make two different cakes at one time. I actually have a magic mill. Some people have a bash. If you don't have either one, it's fine. Make a single recipe. You can make one recipe at a time. So that's why it looks like more than six eggs. Here it is. It's twelve eggs. Okay, so I'm going to put in the eggs and the sugar. When I make this recipe, no one knows that it's gluten free. So this is a gluten free cake, it tastes like a regular cake. And here is the um, quote unquote flour that we use in this cake, it uses potato starch. So that's why I say, if you have potato starch left over from Pesach, you can make a gluten-free cake all year. It has potato starch. Uh, all the ingredients are eggs, sugar, oil, cocoa, potato starch, baking soda, vanilla, and salt. So here's the potato starch. Actually, the original recipe from the gourmet coach of cooking is not called the salt, but I added it. So, I'm going to let this, because you can hear me while that's going, I'm going to let that become mixed. This one recipe will make a bunt pan, a bunt cake, or a nine by 13 rectangular cake, or it will also make 27 cupcakes uh, using a quarter cup measuring cup. So I'm gonna beat this a little more and then show you how to prepare uh, the pans. Make sure I got all the vanilla in there. So you how to prepare the pans. Now I wanna tell you something interesting. When a recipe, call, when a recipe calls for greasing and flouring a pan. Normally you would grease it with margarine and or butter, whatever you're making a milk or pie, and then put flour in it. You have to be very careful when you're making a gluten-free cake. If you're preparing the pan, you cannot use flour, you use potato starch. Okay, so this is my paste of potato starch. Uh, I have mishpacha, it doesn't matter, you can have yeftin, whatever, or manashevitz, whatever you like. And so I'm going to show you how to grease and flour this pan. 
And then while this is beating and making a lot of noise, I will fill this pan with half the batter. And I've prepared a nine by 13 pan, which I have lined with parchment paper. Now parchment paper is your best friend in gluten-free cooking because it'll help things come out more easily. And sometimes gluten-free stuff tends to fall apart a little bit. Not this recipe, but other some recipes do that. So parchment paper is a good idea if you can put it. Obviously you're not gonna use parchment paper in a bun pan. So um, I'm gonna finish beating this up and grease this pan and show you how to flour it. Oh, and I'm gonna tell you something very interesting. Because gluten-free recipes are a little bit sensitive or more temperamental, I like to say, there are certain ingredients that are gluten-free that are better to use in a recipe than others. For example, this is Fleischmann's margarine. When a recipe calls for butter and you want to make a parab, the best margarine to use in a gluten-free recipe is Fleischmann's. Okay, I don't work for them. I don't get a cut from them. But Fleischmann's is the best one. Others have more water content or whatever it is, and they sometimes get too mushy. This is excellent. So Fleischmann's, I got that idea from a gluten-free gourmet, a cookbook on a woman who, uh, who taught in the culinary institute. And she said that, um, that Fleischmann's is the best one, and that's what I use. So I'm gonna finish beating up this batter and I'll be um, greasing and flouring this pan with potato starch. And um, yes, I want to tell you one more thing. The other thing is this, when I put in this parchment paper, I spray the pan first and then put in the parchment paper. That helps the parchment paper lie flat so it's not popping up over it, all over the place. The other thing you have to be careful of in, in when you use a cooking spray, this is, I use Walmart stuff for everything. It's the cheapest thing around. And a, a, a lot of their ingredients now have an OU. Uh, plug with the OU. And, um, but nowadays, some sprays, especially ham, have flour in them. And they put that in there to make your cakes or cookies, whatever, come out easier from the pan. You have to be very careful that it's not a flour-based cooking spray. This is just plain old ordinary cooking spray, vegetable oil or canola oil, whatever. So that you have to do watch out for. And when we've gone to people for shop and they want to bake something for my husband, you know, they usually cry. They just call me up and tell me what you're using. And, and, um, and, you know, we go from there. We just listen to the ingredients. So um, I'm going to finish baking, uh, beating this up. This all went in together. You see, it was very simple. It didn't have to separate eggs or anything. Just dump it all in the in a mixer, and I'm going to grease and flour this pan. A few years ago, when gluten-free just became very popular, so somebody called me who was making, producing DVDs, you know how old this is, DVDs and selling them on the internet. And they asked me to do a series of DVDs on gluten-free, which I forgot to put in the bio, but that's fine. And they said, make sure when you show your things that you face it towards the camera. So that's where I, where I learned that trick about holding it this way. Okay, so... We're going to take out the batter. I once took a decorating plant from, um, from Wilkins and um, 
They gave out these two nice spatulas. That helped you take batter out more easily. So I'm putting half the batter in this bun pan, and I'm putting the other half the batter in this nine by 13 pan. I mentioned Wilton's, um, all the sugar things that they make, you know, a lot of things in Wilton's has, uh, you know, sugar candies and decorative things like that. Those things are generally, I mean, I looked at them years ago, they were all just basically sugar, sugar, sometimes sugar with some, some, uh, some other things that were all gluten free, no problem. Uh, you can go just check your food in because I guess theoretically there was some situation recently. I'm trying to remember what happened, and I was very shocked to find out there was wheat in something that that did not seem like it should have had wheat. Um, I'll tell you some common things. Soy itself is gluten free. However, soy sauce, most soy sauces today, especially the very good ones, have wheat in them. So even though soy itself is gluten-free, soy sauce very often has gluten. Um, La Choy mostly doesn't. It's the cheapest soy sauce. And there are some soy, soy sauces that will stay gluten-free. If you're ever wondering, uh, then you can always check the label and, you know, if it says gluten-free, you're okay. Uh, unless, of course, it has oats in there, in which case you have to be careful, as I said before. So I'm going to put this, I have two ovens going now. I'm going to stick this in the top oven. Okay, and that bakes for 45 minutes. Set my timer. Okay, so I don't forget to take it out. Okay, now I'm going to take out, like with the magic of uh, TV, like they used to say with the and Martha Stewart, the two cakes that I made previously to show you how they come out. So here's the bun cake. And this is very easy. Here, I'll show it to you like that. It's the bun cake. And what I do to make it look pretty is take a, a confectioner sugar container like this and I take a little confectioner sugar like that. Put a little confectioner sugar in here. I didn't write that on the recipe, but not too difficult. And just sprinkle it on top. And that makes a very lovely presentation, which is very simple. You don't have to make a patch here around with icing. And it looks lovely. Um, and it's a very easy cake to make. There you have a beautiful cake for Shabbos. And you can make your gluten-free company happy or your family happy. Or a lot of people are calling me now. Their grandchildren were just diagnosed with celiac, which they make them. And I'm going to show you how this recipe converts beautifully into cupcakes. And I'm going to show you a show-stopping recipe that we're just about to do with the 9 by 13 pants. I'm going to put this aside. Okay, here's the nine by 13 pan, a cake, once it has come out of the oven. Now I'm gonna show you what we do with it. This is a recipe that's called chocolate, chocolate strawberry shortcake. 
So I put on this paper the basic recipe so you have it all in one place and you don't have to refer back to the other recipe. So here on this page is the basic cake recipe followed by how to make a chocolate strawberry shortcake. So we start off with the nine by 13 cake. Now this, I'll tell you something very interesting, okay? There's a basic rule in gluten-free baking. Never throw anything out. If by mistake you baked a cake and you forgot to put in baking soda, then the crumbs are not gonna taste better when you make it, make it into something else. But if in this cake in particular, very often you'll get a dome, depending on your oven, depending on the kind of pan you put it in. And if you get a dome and you want a nice flat cake, you can cut off the dome. And you've got all this chocolate cake, which can be converted into cake crumbs. Now I'm gonna show you in our fourth recipe, how to convert those cake crumbs into rum balls. But in the meantime, this cake came out pretty flat, so I didn't have to um, make cake crumbs out of it. So what we're gonna do is take a long knife, like your hollow knife, and we're gonna cut this cake in half horizontally. Okay. And hopefully it came out pretty good. and this is the bottom half. So now we've got two nine by 13 cakes. Now I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do here. Okay, let me get my uh, beater just a minute. So on the recipe, it says a large container. I should have put 16 ounces because that's what the large container is. We want two eight ounce containers of Rich's Wick. Now Rich's Wick is gluten-free. You can look at it at all of this is a bunch of chemicals. In general, you don't have to worry about things that are just a bunch of chemicals. Um, so Rich's Whip is a Geffen. I'm going to tell you something. The best whipping cream is Rich, Rich's Whip. And for Pesach, I think the best one is Geffen. So that has been my experience. And you can get these like non-dairy creamers. They're okay too. Um, just check in in case something decide to put something weird in there. But in the meantime, I haven't seen any problem with that. So I'm going to empty two eight-ounce containers of Rich's Whip into the beater. That makes a lot of racket. I'm going to, I took a quart of strawberries and you wash them according to your local Orthodox rabbi. I cut off the tops and wash them. And now I'm going to cut all of them in half. And that's what's going to decorate the top of the strawberry shortcake. I'm going to take a knife and cut them in half while this is beating so you can see how I cut them.
in half and you want to cut them in such a way that you have two nice halves of a strawberry. Okay, I'll continue beating them. another minute. Take the whipping cream that you've just beaten up with nothing added, just plain whipping cream, and you spread it on the cake. A half of it, excuse me. Half of it goes on the middle, and the other half is going to go on the top. I don't know if I've like that. Yes. Okay. Now I take my offset spatula. I love, oh my God, which I love, and spread this around on the cake. When I took that Wilton's class, the teacher said, your goal is to have your company say, oh, wow, when you present the cake. So hopefully this will accomplish that feat. Doesn't have to be perfect as long as it gets on the cake. And it looks nice. Okay, now we're going to take the top layer that we separated from the bottom layer and place it on top of this layer. Okay, there we go. Hopefully it won't fall apart. Okay, now. We're going to place the whipped cream on top of this layer, the rest of the whipped cream. Now, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this video, but this could have beaten up a lot thicker, a lot stiffer. Okay, but it is what it is. Okay, it accomplished the purpose, but I like it stiffer, but you can't tell that it's not that stiff, so it's fine. Okay, now, this is just the same thing in a smaller version, a small offset spatula. If you're a person who likes to bake cake, it is worth it to have an offset spatula. But if you have a regular knife, that's fine too. Okay, now comes the strawberries that we cut up. Okay, the strawberries. Now you can put them on however you like, but I like putting them on, on a diagonal. And I like the top and bottom ones to use my big strawberries and I use the smaller ones for the center. 
That's just how I do it, but you can do it however you like. And I'm not that artistic, but I'm sure many of you are and we'll come up with an even prettier design. Okay, so now I'm gonna hold this up so you can see what I'm doing. Laying this across here in a diagonal design all over the cake. Okay. Slide off, that would not be a good thing. I don't remember where this recipe came from, so I apologize that I can't give credit because I had it for a long time and I don't remember where I first got it. It probably was a regular recipe that I just adapted to gluten-free. Whenever I see a recipe that calls for chocolate cake as a base, I just use this chocolate cake and then go from there. You can mostly do that. Um, with this recipe, that's very simple. If you want to adapt a regular recipe and make it gluten-free, you can't just automatically substitute potato starch. That will not work. Some recipes lend themselves to easy, easy adaptation. For example, if you have a recipe that only has a half a cup of flour in it, then sometimes I would you know, put in a half a cup of potato starch and it'll work fine. But don't be upset if you try something that's a non-gluten-free recipe and you want to make it gluten-free and you can't just do it with a sim simple adaptation because um, it's easier to start with a recipe that's, that's indicated that it's a gluten-free, excuse me, a gluten-free recipe because then you won't be aggravated that you spent all that time making a cake and it's not, it didn't come out the way you wanted because it's wasn't meant to be a gluten-free cake. Now I'll tell you something that I've discovered not too long ago, which is quite a very uh, fascinating and also very helpful. As I said, Walmart has a lot of kosher products. And the other thing that they have is a gluten-free flour mix. Let me see if I have it in my pantry, I'll show it to you. Yeah, it's called Great Value Gluten-Free All-Purpose Flour. The, the print is, is worn off a little. Great Value, it says Gluten-Free Flour. And if you can see those words, All-Purpose, what does it say Gluten-Free? Yeah, right here it says Gluten-Free. Okay, I guess that's what the, it was. Oh, here we got, took off the paper. Gluten-free, all-purpose flour. Now you can't get it at every Walmart. I got it in a super Walmart. And I have used this in regular recipes that have just very little flour, maybe a cup and a half of flour, and but not more than that. And so far it's worked pretty well. Um, if a recipe calls for three cups of flour, I'll make a half a recipe and see how that works. And also, um, uh, it, you know, sometimes I may add a little extra baking powder or baking soda to the recipe because what's missing in gluten-free recipes very often is the lift, you know, to help it rise because you're talking about flours that are not as light. There's no substitute for wheat, you know, like, you know, wheat is a very special grain and we put all kinds of things together to kind of mimic wheat, but it doesn't really do that. So very often we have to put in a lot of egg whites or more baking powder to help the cake um, rise. This chocolate cake happens to be a no-fail cake so that you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so now comes the piece de resistance on the top of this cake. Here's how it looks when you finish putting all the strawberries on it. It's very nice, but wait till you see the top, which is gonna look very, very pretty, hold on. So, the last 
ingredient on the recipe says um, three ounces of melted chocolate. So you know when you melt chocolate in a microwave, you have to do it in a glass bowl usually, and that works much better than um, other things. So I'm going to stick this in my microwave for a couple of minutes, and then mix it, and then let it uh, then microwave it again until we get a nice chocolatey uh, syrup. And when that's all done, we're going to take a spoon and just drizzle it over the top, and it makes a very, very beautiful presentation. Um, and after that, we're going to make the cream-filled cupcake. So I'll discuss that while that, that is um, microwaving. Um, one recipe, as I mentioned, of this chocolate cake makes between 24 and 27 cupcakes. If you use a quarter cup measuring cup, it'll make you about 27 cupcakes. Always put them in parchment paper. And um, I'll show you what we're gonna do with them very shortly. Now, every microwave is a little different. So my microwave is 31 minutes. I'm giving it another minute, a uh, minute and a half, and we'll see if that's enough to melt all that chocolate. Um, and so, I don't know, you can sing a song or something while you're waiting. Uh, I want to see what else I wanted to tell you about. Um, yeah. I want to get, I want to drop the box, yeah. Okay. All right, so, um, yeah. Chocolate, oh, right. Chocolate, just plain bittersweet chocolate is gluten-free. Um, most, a lot of candy, especially for kids, just those sugary candies, most of them are gluten free, but I'm not going to account for anything uh, unless you check your ingredients, okay? Okay, I think that should be ready by now. This is a little thicker than I wanted it to be. So I'm going to add a drop of oil. It depends what kind of chocolate you use also. Oh, this is better. Okay. That's it on the recipe because I never had that happen before that it shouldn't be able to pour. So it happened today, so that's fine because this way you can see what happens when it doesn't work exactly the way you want. So just a tiny drop of oil will make it. Now watch, you just take this and you drizzle it over the cake. I do it on a diagonal that gives it a very pretty design. Now you have what I hope will be a show-stopping recipe. Here you are, chocolate strawberry shortcake. And there's the top. And that's how you present it. You can put it on a pretty platter. And most people think this is a very, very beautiful cake. There you go.
Okay. I hope you enjoy it when you make it. Now, in terms of freezing, this chocolate cake freezes extremely well. What I would do if you were making the strawberry tart, I would make the whole cake and do the strawberries before, like the day before you're going to serve it because strawberries don't freeze that well, fresh strawberries. They just will get mushy. So a little or a little soft. If you don't mind that, it's fine. You can freeze the whole thing. But what I would do is make the whole cake and then the, the day before do the whole strawberry thing and the chocolate and then you'll have it you know, ready. Um, that, uh, that's what I would recommend. I'm going to put this aside and now we'll start with the cupcake. Okay, as I said, one recipe makes between 24 and 27 cupcakes. I'm just showing you one pan of 12. This comes out, this is a half a recipe, but all right. This is 12 cupcakes and I'll show you how to make cream filled cupcakes. These are really, really pretty and very delicious. Okay, let's get the recipe. Cream filled cupcakes. For the cupcakes, I repeated the recipe so you have it all in one sheet. And we're gonna talk about the filling. A cup of whipped vanilla frosting and a half a cup of marshmallow cream. Okay, let's do that. Oh, I wanna show you a cute trick. Okay, when you have something sticky like marshmallow fluff or or um, icing, the, the easiest way, you may know this already if you're a baker, the easiest way to get it out of a measuring cup is spraying it first. Just spray. And remember that I said that check to make sure the spray is flour. Okay, so let's get the marshmallow. Okay, marshmallow fluff is gluten free. I use regular marshmallow fluff. And we need a half a cup of that. Half a cup of marshmallow flour. I'm going to put it in this bowl. Falls right in. It was a little bit short, so I'm going to put in a little more. Okay. And now I'm going to put in one cup of Duncan Hines with capping. This is Duncan Hines vanilla. And this is also gluten free. You'll see many things now that are ready made. You don't have to start from scratch and cook your own sugar or anything. Let me get one cup of that. Okay, one cup of whipped vanilla icing. Put that in and it slides right out because we sprayed the bowl first. Okay, now so what we do is mix that together. That's going to make the cream filling. Okay, now this is very cute. Okay, now take a plastic spoon and just scoop it off. Now, I personally like to use a pastry bag, but for those of you who don't have a pastry bag, we're going to make this very simple and put it into a Ziploc bag. If you have a pastry bag, you put a tip on the end of it and fill it up with this cream and it'll It'll work very easily. Now I'll show you what we do first.
First, we take a wooden spoon. We take a wooden spoon and we push a hole in the center like this, all the way to the bottom of each cupcake. Now we have holy cupcakes, if you can see that. Okay, now we're gonna get a little bit black bag. Obviously you don't wanna get the thinnest one you have, one that has a little body to it. I'm gonna take this cream that we've just made. Bag. I'm not going to do all of it right now. But you'll, just get, you'll, get, you'll just get the idea. I'll take a scissor and cut off the tip. Okay, now, we take this and scoop it into the center. Of course, it depends how much cream you want. If you want more cream, you can make the hole bigger. Your tip like mostly cream. Okay, you know, just scoop off the top of the cup, please. Whatever, however you want to do it, it's fine. Okay. Now you have more cream because as I said, the cream is a recipe for all 27 and I only did 12 here. So now this is very pretty. Now what we're gonna do is make the, the pretty, the chocolate top, all right? That's the frosting, a cup of whipped chocolate frosting. Hold on. Okay, now have another glass bowl. I'm going to spray this again. with tap, a cup of um, frosting. It calls for whip, I didn't have whip, so I just used regular. And Pillsbury and Duncan Hines are both fine. Make sure it says, some of them are milchic. So since I like all my baked goods to be power, unless I'm making cheesecake, then um, it slides right out. So we had a cup of icing. What else we have to put in here? A half a cup of chocolate chips. I know I just brought them over here. Okay. Half a cup of chocolate chips. This is a third of a cup. So that'll make it a half a cup. Okay, and two teaspoons of corn syrup. Okay, here's, oh, it's another, this is another good um, uh, hint. This is from Target. They have huge bottles of corn syrup and it's very inexpensive. I don't remember what I bought it, probably way before COVID and it has an OU on it. So just be careful when you look for an OU that, you, that things are not melted. Uh, two teaspoons of corn syrup. One. Okay. Now we're going to microwave this together until it becomes 
nice and smooth. And Oh, this is interesting. It says microwave uncovered for 30 seconds, and then you stir it. And if it needs more dissolving, you microwave it some more. In my microwave, it's finished in 30 seconds. So that's probably going to be finished pretty soon. Let's check it out. Okay, that's going to take a little bit longer because the first time I made it, I only made half a recipe. So now this is going to be finished in another two seconds. And then we're going to take each of these cupcakes and dip it in that yummy chocolate syrup. And then it's going to harden. Okay, here we go. That is what you just made. That's a nice chocolatey uh, bite frosting. And now this is really good for 27 cupcakes, but we only have 12. So I'm gonna have a lot of this left over that I'll be able to use for something else. Actually, you could probably put this on that. Yeah, you could put this on that bunt cake and it makes a beautiful presentation with chocolates glowing all around. That is really delicious. Here's what one looks like, okay? So we're gonna ice all these. Now when you eat, when you eat these or the kids eat these or whoever eats them, they're gonna have a surprise because inside is that delicious cream filling. Now, the other thing you can do, which is really adorable, if you have a birthday or not even a birthday just for shopping, if you wanna make the kids feel really special, or your husband feel really special, or your mother and father feel really special, or yourself feel special. When this dries, it has a nice glaze, the chocolate glaze, really. When that dries, you take some more of that vanilla icing, put it in a pastry bag with a little fine tip, and you can make a swiggle on top, or you can make a letter. They're mon then they're called monogrammed cream filled cupcakes, which was a famous Betty Crocker recipe, which is where I got this cream filling recipe from, Betty Crocker. Okay, so all these now are cream filled cupcakes and with a delicious chocolate almost like a chocolate ganache. Chocolate ganache is just made with chocolate, bittersweet chocolate and cream, like a power of whipping cream. That's, that's how you make ganache. This is not a ganache, this is really a frosting. And as I said, you could pour it over that bun cake and it the beautiful tongue. So here you have chocolate cream filled cupcakes. And when it's dry, you could put some kind of a letter on top or a swiggle, a design, whatever you want, hearts, anything that you want. You can make them special for a birthday and it makes a delicious cupcake. Okay. Now, if we have time, two minutes for one more quick recipe. Um, I just want to get the recipe. Yeah. These are called chocolate rumbles. And all it is, you take a cooked cake or cookie crumbs from cake that didn't work, something failed, something didn't rise properly, the pan fell over in the oven, and I have all this cake, and I don't know what to do with it. Never throw out anything gluten-free because it has a good use. So this is cookie crumbs. I made it from cookies because I, I didn't have any more 
you know, bad cake lying around. I had some vanilla cake. I hope if we do another recipe, there's another, there's a roll cake I make that I cut off the ends and I save all those ends and I make them into crumbs. And here we have crumbed up cookies or you can use that chocolate cake and you'll have it to make chocolate rumbles. Okay, so it calls for two cups of gluten-free cookies or cake crumbs, a quarter of a cup of cocoa, I'm putting in, and a tablespoon of rum. Oh, I wanna make, I wanna mention alcohol. Okay, so people ask me all the time, can I serve liquor to your husband? It's got, it's made from wheat, it's alcohol. So my husband gave me a crash chemistry course this morning and said, when you heat up something that you want to use to make whiskey, even though you're starting with wheat, what happens when you heat up the wheat and the water in there, the alcohol and the, 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 the fumes go across a tube into another flask. And when that just gets distilled, which is called the distilling process, when that gets distilled, you have alcohol. Because it's distilled, that alcohol does not have the wheat in it that it started with, and the distilling process eliminates any gluten. He said, but you have to be careful. Sometimes people want to put in some wheat to enhance the flavor. He's never had that happen, and he will drink, uh, you know, like a scotch or, you know, he doesn't like bourbon, but he likes scotch, and he'll drink a scotch once in a while, and, you know, that's perfectly fine. This is rum. Rum is not made from wheat at all. It's made from sugar, so that's no problem. Ultimately. Okay, so that, that's a quarter of a cup of cocoa, a tablespoon of rum, two tablespoons of rice milk. Now, I often use rice milk um, to substitute for milk. People use almond milk. I prefer rice milk because it doesn't impart any flavor. It's a totally neutral flavor. Okay, so then you can just do this with your hands. You mush it together like this. Or if you're very picky, you can do it with a spoon. Right? And it'll start to form a cake mass like this. And all you do, this is good. It makes one big dough like that. You roll it like this. Just make rumbles. You're not baking anything. The cake is already baked. You go like this. And I need another bowl. Okay, I'll just stick it in here. Put some sprinkles in here. And you take the rum balls one at a time. You press them into the sprinkles like that. Use my chocolatey hands. And that's how you get gluten-free balls. Can you see that? You can put them in coconut and nuts. Very often people that have, not very often, sometimes people that have better gluten free also have other allergies like nut allergies. And so you may not want to put them in nuts. You may want to put them in sprinkles, but sprinkles are also gluten free. I wanted to show you, yeah, I have a plate of them. And here's an entire plate of gluten free rum balls that were rolled in sprinkles, okay? This particular recipe came out much softer, so it was easier to press the sprinkles into them. And that's it. We've got four recipes from one cake. I hope you all find this enjoyable. I hope you get a chance to make them. And it's been a pleasure, a pleasure dealing with Judy and the OU. Elaine, thank you so <laughs> much. You gave us so many, uh, it wasn't even just the wonderful recipes and how beautiful they look. You gave us so many wonderful techniques and strategies. Uh, I think everybody got so much from it. We want to thank you for welcoming us into your kitchen. Anytime. And well, everything that we learned today, I want to remind everybody that of course, um, all of our programs from the OU are for informational purposes only. Please don't take on any dietary restrictions or changes or anything else before you check it with your own personal physician. Can I mention one thing? 
Absolutely. People will call me and say, oh, I've decided to become gluten-free. I'm going to lose weight. I said, no, no, no. Gluten-free is not a recommended option for people who don't need to. It is not healthy for people who don't need it because you are eliminating a lot of B vitamins. And once again, I'm not giving you medical advice, but there's a lot of B vitamins. There are a lot of B vitamins in wheat products. So do not take on a gluten-free diet unless you need to. Okay. That's exactly it. So if you are told by medical professionals that what, that you need this, then you refer to everything you've learned today. The recipes should have been in the emails that you received for this program. It will also be uh, in our archives within a couple of weeks. Uh, so we want to thank Elaine so much for teaching us all these wonderful, wonderful techniques. Everything looked beautiful and delicious. And what I love the most is when you showed us how to recycle the crumbs that didn't work because we all have those problems. So I think That's that right. was wonderful. I wanna remind everybody that all of our programs prior to November 1st uh, could only be accessed through the archives. Our Zoom account changed. So none of the uh, programs that I sent links out to will work, but they're all in the archives. So you can visit them there. And all of our more recent programs will be in there shortly. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Elaine Bodenheimer, for a wonderful, wonderful uh, session. And I think we'll all be baking soon. Thank you. Be well. Okay.